So if you're watching on YouTube, you missed the first few minutes of the show. You missed Lou Sander sharing pretty long-winded story, I would say, about... <laughs> I asked him how he was doing. He gave this long response. It was, what was it exactly? And I quote, uh, everything's I fine. I, or I think I said, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Wow. <laughs> you missed that. If you're, if you're not watching this on the uh, Liberty Principal well, my, Facebook page. Go ahead. My beard, my beard monopolized the conversation. Now. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Your beard monopolizes a lot of conversations. Yeah. I, li I listened so, to... Go ahead. Somebody else says you want to climb my beard, and and somebody says, "Now nah, Lou's beard climbs you." <laughs> yeah, you know, in Soviet Russia, Lou beard climb you. <laughs> Actually, in America, Lou, Be wherever you are, Lou beard climb you. <laughs> so we're we're gonna. Yeah. What what was that? Uh, any? I, I don't said, know Thank Russian, you, comrade. I'm not a commie, so I don't know. I Russian. said comrade. Yeah, but you said They're something not in Russian. Anymore either. You you know Kami? Do you speak Kami? No, I don't. Do but you own after it? the after the Berlin Wall came down, everybody quit being commies. Okay. It just that that was like the uh the Eye of Sauron. So when the Berlin Wall <laughs> came down, the Eye of Sauron got the like whole... extinguished, exploded, something like that, whatever. And all of a sudden the captured minds were set free and released from their from their captivity and servitude and they were able to become Russian citizens. So it's like that I don't know, there's been numerous movies where if you kill the head vampire, like all the people that are vampires that were created by the head vampire turn into normal people. It was kind of like that. Like the Berlin Wall was the head vampire? Yes. And now everything's great. Everything's grand. Communism is dead. You don't have to worry about it. It's done. In America... No, communism, communism, unfortunately, won't effing die. That's the problem. <laughs> well, it, it's taken on many forms through the millennia, whatever you want to call it. It's, uh, uh, Busybody there, collectivism. There's a lot of starvation, but there's... There's just not enough final solution in it. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I. I. I, but, I but only it, it do there's... shows with Lou. I'm. I'm not his friend. <laughs> don't don't <laughs> play. <laughs> but but in the defense of communists, real communist, real communism has not been achieved yet, and that won't happen until the last soldier shoots himself and falls onto the body of the last executed <laughs> civilian in the mass grave. Then you have full communism. And as he falls down, he whips a sun a sign out of his pants and and displays it high above. See, communism works. <laughs> We're all dead. We're all dead. Now we're all equal, right? Total yes. total redistribution of wealth, total equality. That's redistribution of blood. Right. <laughs> and brain matter. Right. So we're gonna do things a little different today, and I guess today this show is gonna be a little experiment. We might do this for other is daily. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the first half of the show. We're actually going to go through our regular three segments. And then the second half, we're going to kind of dive into something a little bit more meaty. A little, it'll take a little bit more time to go through something. So without ado, why don't we, why don't we hit the first segment? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, let's see how well these well-laid plans of yours last. Well, since I came up with them about an hour ago, <laughs> it's... Yeah, it's this, all go. This is man. under the impression that you and that neither of us, mostly me, are not going to get sidetracked. No, I would never do that. You know me, <laughs> and I know you. Right. We stay right on point. And just like now, we didn't get sidetracked and talk an additional five <laughs> minutes before we got to the intro. And here we go. Our course of association shortening the leash on their pets. We cover stories of the state. The government, the coercive enterprise, the coercive association, plotting to or succeeding in shortening the leash on those they presume to rule. Welcome to a shorter leash. And here we are, folks. We have the shorter leash. I I try to pick stories that I think will amuse you. I think I picked a good one here for you. What do you think? You scan Wait, over you're it. Here to, you're here to amuse me. 
I am. What are you, a clown? What's so funny are about you? Are you calling me a clown? Are you calling me a clown? Are you yes, calling me a clown? Oh, you are. Okay. I just wanted to just wanted to make that clear. We're cool. That's cool. That's that's totally cool. So IMF complains about US tax cuts, warns it's bad for children. And and of course, my alternative title, just to remind you folks, the show title, Steal More Stuff for the Children. <laughs> I mean that's that's what it breaks down to, right? Well, wait a minute. Isn't isn't a child's parents having more money in their pocket good for children? It could be, unless, of course, it's not state approved. So, Oh, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's tricky that way. So, so the, the global science, well, social, not science, social engineering corporation, that's what I'm calling the IMF. I'm calling it a global social engineering co corporation. What do you think? They got the MF part right. <laughs> they do. Yeah, and there's very little I in the MF. It's you. You. <laughs> yeah. UMF. <laughs> there's no I in MF. <laughs> yeah, there is. Actually, oh, there is. For God's sakes. <laughs> right. So um, they're, they're warning the global community that the efforts by the U.S. to, and I'm going to say this, they didn't, but I am, allegedly reduce the amount of money it takes from people for having the privilege of exchanging value between one another within American borders or or simply with people who reside in the borders. Uh, it's just it's it's just bad for the economy. Now this assumes of course that while the federal government is lowering taxes here, it's not raising taxes in other areas that you're not even you know, you're not even picking oh, you, up on. You mean like supporting a 25 uh, cent gas tax, or tariffs, or tariffs yeah. on on imported goods, also known as affirmative action for domestic producers, or engineered uh, uh, inflation. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's there's numerous ways. You know, it's this. It's it's actually that's kind of the longer leash theme. You know, they they give in one hand and they reach around with the other. So while they, they extend with one hand and reach around with the other, you don't want that reach around, trust me. And th this is from New York Mag, IMF Managing Director, Christine Lagarde. By the way, I don't know if you picked up on that. You should hiss when you hear, whenever you hear IMF Managing Director, you should automatically be hissing. It should be like, like Darth Vader music or... I don't know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. Luke, I'll raise your taxes. That's Christine Lagarde. <laughs> Said the, the Trump administration's $1.5 trillion tax cut, I believe it when I say it, could prompt other nations to follow suit, fueling a, quote, race to the bottom, quote, that risks hemming in public spending. And and I'm going to read this paragraph from Lagarde. I want to read it in a very snooty way. Do you have any accents that you would recommend that I use for the snoot? Hmm. Can you do a British man from New Jersey? Oh, I'm not even going to come close, but in my mind, uh, I'm nailing it. <laughs> What comes out of my mouth? Probably not nailing it. Uh, uh, what what we are beginning to see already, and what is of concern, is the beginning of a race to the bottom. Where many other eh? Eh? policy members, eh? Yeah. Oh, they, I'll just throw in an A. With many oh, other no. eh. policy, not A. That's Canadian. Oh, okay. If you're going, if you're going to do like New Jersey, particularly up by Philly, you're going to have to throw in a eh, eh, eh. Okay, eh. What uh, what we are beginning to see already, and what is eh, of concern, is the beginning of a race to the bottom, where many other policy makers eh, around the world are saying, "Well, eh, if you got a if you got a tax, and you you're gonna have to sweep, you're gonna have sweet deals with your corporates. I'm gonna do the same thing. You need public money. The race to the bottom is not conducive." to those investments to helping 
this is I mean this is this is where they earned their title social you know international social engineering corporation to helping prepare the workforce and our societies for this new economy of tomorrow why don't you stop preparing and just chill and so the translation on this is that the money is better managed by those who collect and spend it rather than those who earn it well, is yeah. what they're saying not and only it, that it, go ahead it, this really flies into what is seen and what is not seen from uh, Bastiat, one of his uh, magnum opuses or op- opusi or opies. Opi? Or, opies? Yeah. His magnum so, opies. Anyway, Claude Frederick Bastiat scribbled some magic words down on paper, and they were effing brilliant. It was the, They were. It was what is seen and what is unseen. It's the story of the broken window fallacy, which – would become the inspiration for quite a bit of uh, Austrian economics. At but didn't time Paul Krugman make an entire career out of that meme? That was a meme, right? Paul Krugman's entire career has been a broken windows meme. That is correct. That's what I thought. That's what so I, I don't I don't know if he made a career out of it or if the meme was made out of his career, but probably the latter. But a little anyway, bit of both, I bet. So the argument that they're making is that uh, the that that the international MFers have to confiscate the money and spend it because that's how the magic happens. Where if the people that actually earn it spend it, then you don't get any magic. Uh, it's in, in the story of the broken window. The uh, there's a shopkeeper and, and some little boy in the neighborhood is playing with a ball and and breaks out the window and and everybody's like, oh man, that's horrible. You know, that that darn hooligan kid. And wow, well, now the shopkeeper's gonna have to buy a new window and blah blah blah. And some guy comes over. Uh, I, I think his name was uh, Monsieur Paul Krugman. Uh, he comes over and he says, "No, no, this is not a tragedy at all. This is a good thing. This is going to, this is going to boom the economy because now the the shopkeeper is going to have to uh, purchase a new window, and that's going to mean work for the glazier and and his employees. And they're going to come over and they're going to install this window, and they're going to get paid to do it. And then they're going to go out and they're going to buy books and and sweaters and take their wives out to dinner and all these different things that they will do now that this money has entered the economy. And the nonsense of that is, well, those same things could have happened had the window not been broken and had the had the shopkeeper not have to hire the glazier to do the repairs because the shopkeeper could have bought the sweaters, the books, taken his wife out to dinner and all these other things. So you have the same potential for economic transactions, but the economy now as a whole is less one window. So what they're really saying though, is the shopkeeper would not have handled his money as well as the glazier would have. Or the shopkeeper would have hoarded right. his money, and of course the glazier would spend it. I mean, that makes well, sense. Well, the, the, the glazier works for the IMF, so of course right. he's a better way of doing it. There, there's <laughs> another one uh, that explains it. Paul Krugman and Ben Bernanke were walking down this, the, this farm road, and Ben says to, to Paul Krugman, he says, Hey, see that big pile of horse shit over there? And and uh, Krugman says, well, yes, I do. And Ben says, well, I'll give you $50,000 to eat that entire pile of shit. So he does. He eats it, and Ben hands him $50,000. And then Paul Krugman says, hey, see all that? See that big pile of cow shit over there? I'll give you this $50,000 that you gave me if you eat the cow shit. And so Ben eats the cow shit, and Paul gives them the money, and, and they're walking around holding their bellies all sore and sick and everything. And says, I don't know why I feel so bad. The economy is $100,000 richer. <laughs> yeah. In other words, they're just moving shit around pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay. they had a couple shit eaters, so it, it, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, moral of the story is don't be a shit eater. <laughs> don't support the IMF. Don't be a shit eater. And don't be a Keynesian. I, don't be a, no, whatever you do, don't be a Keynesian. I mean, I could put up with the Chicago school folks at least a little bit better than I can the Keynesians, but that's another story. 
I think let's 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 do this. Let's get to the next story. Let's go to Longer Leash. Are you ready for Longer Leash? Can we do this? I'm re- I'm ready for a Longer Leash. Okay, we're going to go. We were on the shorter leash, and now it's time. How are coercive associations lengthening the leash on their pets? We cover stories of the state, the government, the coercive enterprise, the coercive association plotting to or succeeding in lengthening the leash on those they presume to rule. Well, this is the part of the show where you sarcastically clap. Yay! Because our masters have decided to at least attempt to do something that would lengthen our leashes. And this story is Florida Bill would prevent cops from confiscating guns without due process. Now, I know what you guys are saying. This is America. This is the land of the free. This is the land of the Bill of Rights. There's no way that people are actually taking guns with people, from people, without due process. Well, Florida has been doing it for years. And the Florida legislators, well, some of the Florida legislators thought, you know what, maybe, just maybe, we could maybe lift our boot off the neck of the surf just a bit. So, Lou, Lou by the way, I, 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 th- I think he's playing, uh, what's that, that candy game that you pe- everybody used to play on Facebook? What was the name of that? Is that, isn't that what you're playing right now? I see your, your, your face in your phone, so you're playing, what is, what was that called? Oh, hit the meth lab. <laughs> oh, is that what you're playing? <laughs> nice. Nice. Hit the meth lab for a uh, new supply, or are you a DEA agent in that game? Or do you switch back and forth? Uh, I don't go both ways. So. <laughs> I anyway. bet you do. I've heard stories. <laughs> I have I've video read about you too, on the internet. The but anyway, so let, let's carry on here. We're trying. I'm trying. So some Florida legislators are considering a bill that would prevent law enforcement officers from confiscating guns without due process. So apparently in Florida, with just a word from your neighbor or a relative or a spouse or maybe a Facebook troll, who knows, the police will come and take your guns from you. And uh, Wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought you could... Put out a, a, a YouTube video where you say that you want to be that that you want to be a school shooter, that you want to shoot up a damn school and have the cops called on you at least twenty times, and, and be well known to law enforcement of all different levels. And when it comes time to do an investigation, they'll just be like, "Man, we're gonna go do some civil asset forfeiture, yo." You you make me sick with that whole thing you just did there. It sickens me. I thought that you were a capitalist. I thought you were for the free market. I thought that you were pro profit, pro making money. And and you're questioning the police and you're calling on them to go pursue something that doesn't make money? What the heck is your problem? Like you said, even you, you 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 had the hint. Man, there's civil asset forfeitures out there for them to get. Why the heck are you bothering them? I mean, are you a commie? Are you not for the free market? No, I am for the free market. That's why I was saying that they wouldn't be bothered to to go shake down some poor kid that doesn't have any money who just, you know, wants to shoot up a school. <laughs> so what you're saying is <laughs> what you're saying is lobsters. That's pretty much what you're saying. Right. Stop it. Stop <laughs> it. You got that? You get that? Go go clean your room. Go clean I, your room. I Stop did. It. I I did right before the show. So uh, this story is from uh, Ammo Lamb. So law enforcement officers will impound firearms when no crime has been committed. Well, yeah, this is driven by a fear of not doing enough combined with the demonization of firearms or it's uh, some sort of profit making business. I'm sure. Uh, so, uh, let me get to uh, the, the. So, is this like civil asset forfeiture, where the where the yeah. uh, firearms are arrested and put on trial? Well, they're they're not put on trial; they're indefinitely detained under NDAA. 
Yes, and and what do you think happens? I mean, this doesn't say this in the article, but I would strongly suspect what do you think happens to a lot of those firearms and why they make it so difficult for people to return them. They probably have them in like a, 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 a hierarchy of storage, you know. Okay, we almost can claim these. We almost can claim these. And they try to hold on them and, and, and wait you out and make it more expensive. And they're counting on most people. What most people probably do is they don't even try. They just give up, especially, I mean, if you have a high point, well, if you have a high point, they're not making any money off that. <laughs> uh, so the, the law is, uh, uh, well, I'll get to the to article here. Florida Representative Cord Bird of Neptune Beach has introduced legislation to rectify this system of legalized theft of arms. The bill H6013 removes Florida provision requiring a court order to return a firearm, whether the firearm was taken by an officer with or without a search warrant upon viewing a breach of peace. And that's what they use. The breach of peace statute is what's being used in Florida to justify the impounding of firearms. How, so, about, how about quit taking firearms from people? Well, un, unless there was due cause, unless and there was a, you know, a due process that you went through. I'm talking about Within the state's like, parameter, not within my parameter. Oh, you mean like making an interview or YouTube video where you say, I'm going to shoot this mother bleeping place up? Something like that. And yeah, something like that. Or or maybe if uh, somebody calls the police department, this is probably much more likely to get your gun seized. If, if somebody of a perceived victim class, an approved victim class, calls you and says, this person is a danger... Then they'll show up and they'll take your guns and they won't, you know, there's, 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 there's no due process. They just take the gun and then you have to prove that you should get your guns back. And it's a process that costs a minimum legal action costs a minimum of $400. And, you know, it could go, I'm, I'm sure it could go higher if they drag it out and find reasons not to let you get your gun well, back. But but I mean, let's be honest. What do you need a gun for when we have police? Well, I that's a good point. That's a really good point. You, you know, had that armed had the armed officer assigned to the school down in Florida actually gone in the building, he might have been able to stop the shooting during the during the course of action. You do realize that they they're not compelled to serve and protect. That's like a myth. They're asking them to do something that constitutionally they don't have to. They don't have to. Well, I know that. I know that. I'm. I'm just. I'm just going by. No, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm just. I'm just going. I'm just I'm, going by the article that came up that says, uh, the, according to the sheriff, the armed officer at the school never entered the building during the shooting. He was probably off cowering somewhere, saying, "Oh my god, how am I going? How am I going to? How am I going to spend my pension if I actually get hurt doing my stupid effing job?" He was. I, I I've read that uh, there was a video of him actually outside the school, cowering and not going in for six full minutes while the shots were going off. He was immobilized. He what, didn't. Why move. would he go in the building? It's dangerous. Well, well, yeah, exactly. Hey, you, you remember the good old days when the only danger from public school was to your child's mind instead of their mind and body. Yeah, but that's still mostly true. The, the <laughs> no, no, it is. It is still mostly well, true. Well, now, now, yeah, by now you have a bit more risk. But anyway, well, do you? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd, I'd like there, to go and back more, and see. I would dare to say that there's more risk of of a school shooting today than there was 30 years ago when I was in high school. But school shootings aren't the only way that you can get killed in school. So, I mean, it's not just school shooting. What? What other ways could you have been killed in school? You could have been well, beat up until you died, or teachers could have abused you until you died. So, I well, you could have fall, I'd be willing you could have to fallen off the swing. You could have fallen off the swing, or or uh, yeah, the swing set or the slide in in gym class or or during recess. But I think all that's gone now. I think for recess you get like some crayons, and some brando. They, they they stick you in a giant marshmallow room and nobody can move. I think yeah. that's how they I, do it now. And then remember, everybody gets a participation true for you afterwards. I remember climbing the rope in the gymnasium, and it was like 30 feet up. 
and they just had these little flimsy thin mats there. So if you fell I down, did that. yeah, yeah, that uh, was a good old days, man. Brian Barker says hammer from the shop class. Yeah, I bet you is. Uh, oh, Larry says cowering. Who is claiming cowering? Uh, no, no, no. Actually, there were. I I saw a couple articles that claimed cowering, but Larry, I also said, I don't know for sure. I only read it in a few places, and that does not authorita and definitiveness make. But uh, I'm inclined to believe it's true, but I don't know. Uh, but what I'm saying, Lou, is I'd be willing to bet that your chances of dying at school were greater in the 80s and the 70s than they are now. I don't know, but I'd be willing to bet. So when I say that you're less risk, maybe maybe school shootings have increased, but when, when do school shootings, school shootings start to increase? I would say school shootings really start to increase when two things begin to happen, and, and, and that's gun-free zones, and then the other thing is uh, more meds, and uh, ultimately... Only individuals act, so it's individuals choosing. But there are circumstances there that have made it easier for someone to make an insane decision like let's go to a school and shoot a bunch of people up. But but if we get back to the Florida story, the the other Florida story that we're, we're touching on, it's nice to know that the legislators, they're just considering. Now, you guys out there with your rule of laws and your bill of rights and all that stuff, you got, you got a place in Florida, well, the whole state of Florida, where they have this practice of seizing stuff from you with no due process. That's like the Fourth Amendment or something, right? Isn't that? Is that the Fourth or Fifth? Which one is it? Which one's due process, man? I, I, I think the, for, the Fourth Amendment is the search, in, yeah, the search, unreasonable, eh, unreasonable searches. And the... Is, I think the fifth is the actual seizures. I, okay. I could be wrong. It's, it's, it's been a while since I looked at the magic parchment. Either way, it's probably fourth and fifth. Uh, but uh, so so there you go. While while you live in the land of the Bill of Rights in Florida, what will and the take to defend your freedom? Right, and what will take the the governments of Florida, all the little fiefdoms of Florida, from coming out to your home and taking your guns without due process is an act by the legislature. It's weird. The, I thought the Constitution would have ran down to Florida. He would have just ran down there, a little parchment body and big old arms and legs bursting out. And it was said, my peoples, and defended them. But, he but didn't. it's obeying the speed limit, so it's going to take a while to get there. <laughs> and, and there's construction on the roads. My roads. Right. And then there, there's tolls. Yeah, you got to pay the tolls in addition to the taxes. So, let's get to the, let's get to longer leash. See, we're gonna do this, Lou. We're gonna do it. It's gonna happen. Are you ready for longer leash? Yes. How are others enjoying lives that exist beyond the reach of the leash of the state, the government, the course of enterprise, the course of association? How, in other words, are people living off the leash, and how might you join them? I said longer leash. I meant off the leash. And you could tell from the bump that it's that it's off the leash. So I Because I it was a, Bug. It was Bug. That is Bug. That's my daughter. She does the narration. I love I love these things when I get to hear because so it's like my wife and my daughter are part of the show, which is awesome. It's great. So this this story is is teen girl uses three D printing to build fashion business. I love this story. This is a now. What I really love about this. Did you scan through this story, Lou? No, I did not have time for this. You're a terrible human being. Yes, uh, objectively. So this is a story of a young woman named Shami Ocean of San Francisco. Let me show you a picture of Shami here. Let me bring. Let me get that up. There you go. There's a picture of Shami. So uh, this is a picture or a story of a young woman named Shami Ocean of San Francisco uh, who took it upon herself to learn how to 3D print and then she used that 3D printing skill to create something she's passionate about fashion and so she's entered the fashion world on her own terms using social media and 3D printing using 
the liberating, self-reliant, enabling technology of 3D printing. Am I overselling this? To uh, create new opportunities for herself through 3D printed clothing. Let me, let me just play this. I think I have this set up so you should hear it, uh, hopefully. Play this real quick here. Well, obviously, it's not 2017 anymore, but uh, so I, what I love about this story, this is a girl that, no, oh, no, she's not an anarchist. She's not a libertarian. I don't know what she is. I don't, I don't know. But she's still experiencing what it means to be self-reliant, self-sustaining, using emerging technologies. And I, and I believe the more people that use this type of technology, especially when they're using it like she is to actually build something enterprising that she can make a, a living off of, a career out of, I, th I think it's going to change people more and more. They're going to adopt a more, I'll say for lack of a better term, libertarian mindset. They will come to appreciate the value of self-reliance and self-sustainability because they're living it. They're experiencing it. That's why I love this story. I concur 100%. I think entrepreneurship, uh, especially in the youth, is it, it really invigorates people. It, it, it gives them something to, to strive for. And for those that are creative enough to stick with it and, and be self-employed for their entire lives, uh, I, it's, it's just really amazing. I, I, I did the uh, – when I was growing up as a teenager, I, I I had jobs, of course, but I also did yard work around the neighborhood. So in the fall, I would rake leaves. Summertime, I did a little bit of grass cutting, uh, shoveling snow in the winter time. And I mean, it's when you're doing that, you're you're a business owner and you have an employee of one. I think it would have been pretty good if I would have been able to expand and and hire some of the younger kids in the neighborhood to work for me. But I knew it was still a pretty good thing and. And I, I wish that I would have had the know-how and the gumption and the drive to become my own business owner for my entire life. Well, I kind of, because of my, my health, I kind of have to be. <laughs> I, I can't really, uh, unless my health changes, and it's only been like this in the past three or four years, but... Unless my health changes, I have issues that I won't say prevent me, but make it difficult for me to show up at a place reliably and work eight to ten hours on a regular shift. So I I work from home. I do contract work. I do whatever I can. I do a lot of contract work. I do SEO, web marketing, web design. So I'm self-employed by choice, but even if I didn't have the health issue, I would much rather be self-employed but when you work from home and you have a health issue i could still get in my eight hours whatever i whatever amount of work i got to get in i just don't get it done on a regular schedule all the time sometimes i gotta shut down i get a lot of migraines weird well anyway you guys don't need to hear about all my health issues <laughs> but e even without my health issues i would i've been doing it so long it would be really difficult for me to go back into that world, back into the world of, of, of having bosses. Oh, I mean, I have bosses now, but they're always shifting bosses. You know, it's clients. So I have them for a while, then I have different. So I don't get locked into that annoying boss, I guess. And uh, if I have enough clients, I can actually fire a boss. I've done that already. Mm -hmm. So... But, but the bottom line is this technology that's emerging, like 3D printing, it's, it's enabling people to do unexpected uh, self-reliant, self-sustaining things. And this is just one of the examples. And now, are you ready to go to the experimental part of our show? Yeah. Yeah. So this is... Yeah, bring it. This is, uh, I don't know if you have the article up there, if you scan through it. I do. Okay, so 
I think what we'll do is, I don't want to read my article. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to list one of his reasons, and then we'll talk about it. And okay. We'll, or we'll just see where it goes. So, this is an article that I wrote, which I'm not going to read. I'm just going to use as a guide. A call to ban porn, or how left-right neo-Puritanism is more alike than different. So, there's this dude, Matt Walsh. And he's a very well-known Christian conservative writer. And he, he writes a lot of polemic-styled stuff. He's, he's all fire and vim and vigor. And he used to write, I, I don't know if he still writes for The Blaze, but right now this is, this is in the site, The Daily Wire. So I don't know if he, you know, a lot of people write for multiple sites, so I'm not sure. He started off writing his own blog called Matt Walsh Blog, was pretty well known for it and then the blaze paid him a lot of money to become the writer on their blog and he's i, I want to point all this out because this is a highly respected member of the conservative community considered one of the thought leaders i think it's important to note that it's not like i'm picking someone here some fringe person some person that nobody reads and trying to hold that person up as somehow potentially representing Christian conservative, social conservative thought. So he writes this article about why it is that porn should be outlawed. Are you triggered already? No, I don't let stupid stuff get to me like that. Oh, that's too bad. So the, the, the first point is porn is prostitution. And he says... Prostitution is illegal in every state save one, yet pornography is legal in every state. And then he goes through this lengthy diatribe. So, so proving the appeal, that porn is, the, so this logical fallacy is appeal to legality and illegality. Yeah, yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing: prostitution is an economic transaction. Uh, I, I know that these anti-business communists out there want to just squash every last remnant of of uh, capitalism but yeah go away i i don't personally think prostitution is a great idea i don't think promiscuity is a great idea i'm not for it personally uh but i will say that criminalizing prostitution makes it more dangerous <laughs> Much more uh, dangerous. Mu so much as more a dangerous. as a conservative, because because the whole point of conservatism is to ensure all the stupid stuff that has been going on for a long time continues. They could they conserve idiotic policies. Uh, when it comes to like the the welfare state, the the liberal Democrats come up with the welfare programs, and then the conservative Republicans conserve those idiotic welfare programs. And there's not a conservative or Republican out there that hasn't met a a social democratic welfare program that they didn't believe that they could run efficiently oh larry said drug deals are economic transactions as well yeah exactly yeah yes they are exactly. thank you larry yep, absolutely you're, you're, thank you you're not you're on your you're way only half the moron i thought you were i know <laughs> you're 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 well on your way there uh so yeah that that hey, was larry, that... larry i i got a request for you can can you like the post the for the for the show can you just put a like on there because i noticed that you didn't drop a like on there oh that's terrible larry why wouldn't you do that you're my bro man why wouldn't you do that larry do is that larry is my token horrible person everybody has a horrible to a token horrible person larry's mine everybody say hi to larry <laughs> so I, yeah. I would feel better if Larry threw a like on this post because he's he's in here Schumer talking a bunch of stuff. And I don't think it. I, I think a like is a proper price of admission for him. I think so. I mean, we're giving you entertainment, Larry. We're giving you rage fits that you can act on. So the least you can do is give us a like. So so the, 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 that that was exactly my argument. This is the but it's against the law argument. So basically, it's. It's this. It should be illegal because it's illegal. Is that a circular isn't that circular logic when you prove something with the very thing that you're trying to prove? Yes. I think yes, so. Yes, it's it's circle jerk logic. It's circular firing squad logic. 
Right. So let's get to the second point. Porn feeds the sex trafficking industry. There is little sense in trying to fight. Porn feeds consumer demand. (laughs) Right. There is little sense in trying to fight sex trafficking while at the same time defending pornography. I don't know why he does that little ography thing as a sacred right. I don't know who's calling it sacred. The link between the two is unmistakable and should be self-evident to any thinking person. Sex traffickers routinely, oh, pardon me, reforce their slaves into pornography. And what what, what are you seeing in that argument? Prohibition feeds sex trafficking. Because it is prohibited, that is created an illicit market. Just like, just like the prohibition of drugs creates an illicit market which incentivizes violence to maintain existing turf and to use violence to expand into new turf. Well, yeah, and it's – to me, this is the – but this action leads to another action that leads to another action that leads to a bad action argument – and and you know who makes those kind of arguments to try to prohibit you from doing things? Put status progressives. That's yes. that's that's the exact argument that they're using actually when it when it comes to guns. So if you oppose gun control because it penalizes everything one for the actions of a few, then and you should feel the same way about porn unless you're insane enough to believe that most porn is the fruit of sex trafficking. And that's absolutely, that's not even close to being true. It's, it's more true to say that sex traffickers may more often than not force their victims into porn than it is to say that most porn is done by sex traffickers. That's simply not true. So you want to penalize the many for the criminal actions of the few. That, to me, sounds like progressive statism, doesn't it? Or statist progressivism, whatever. However, yes. however, however you want to look at that. <clears throat> it's the same exact logic. Am I missing something? No, you're, you're not missing anything at all. You are 100% correct in your assertions. So, we we'll get to the third one. Porn destroys children. An American child is first introduced to hardcore internet porn porn at the age of 11 on average that's the argument gonna let that what what gotta have a thought on that i i'm a pretty creative guy but i i don't even know what the hell he's talking about well what he's saying is that there's something going on that if children are exposed to it, it could hurt them. Therefore, we should shut it down. Like children being exposed to violent video games or vulgar movies. Strangely enough, that age is roughly... That's roughly the age that sex ed is taught in the public schools these days. I think they do it in like fifth or sixth grade, something like that. Or at least they did way back when. I wonder if he has a problem at all with the indoctrination process that children go through right from the beginning where they're 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 not forced but they're kind of pre- it's presented in a way that everybody does it and that's the, the you know the pledge of allegiance at the beginning of the day what kind of damage does that do to a child that conditions them to to start to believe unquestionably unquestioningly in authority what what does that do to cut off their their potential human growth? Probably more than seeing porn when they're eleven. Don't get me wrong. I'm not for children seeing porn when they're eleven. Just 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 to make that clear. But again, to me, this reveal, reveals again what a true progressive this Matt Walsh dude is, because like yes. them, he wants to prohibit anything from everyone that might have an effect on someone, a bad effect, a negative effect on someone. 
And look, if it, if it saves one child, why not just ban all porn and guns? Ban all porn, ban all guns, children getting a hold of alcohol, dangerous, ban alcohol, uh, ban, bat, you know, violent video games, ban uh, R-rated movies. I'm, cars have hurt children. If a child escape, you know, if that child gets behind the wheel and it has happened, a child's gotten behind the wheel and driven it and injured themselves. Well, then we should ban all cars because children might hurt themselves. Where does it stop? Where's that line where you decide, okay, this is the percentage that we're looking for. This is the percentage of children that are affected by this. And at this magic percentage number, that's when the prohibition kicks in where we prevent everyone from being able to do this. Well, children can't get hurt if you ban children. That's true. That is that is absolutely excellent. And uh, Ty says, I see porn. I see I, I saw porn when I was young by accident. Hide your porn well. Dude, they didn't have the interwebs when I was a well, yeah, when I was a kid. I'm just gonna tell you that I, I found porn when I was eleven. Yeah. And I found some I don't know. Yeah, it's easier to find it with the interwebs, but I found it, and I found some hardcore stuff. I'm not going to say how hardcore, but it was. It, some of it was disturbing. I'm not saying it's good for kids to see porn. It's not. I do not approve. I do not condone it. But what this guy wants to do, he he basically wants to do what progressives want to do. He wants to prevent. You, he wants to protect you. Matt Walsh is the Lord Protector of all, who will determine what is safe and what is not safe, and he will 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 protect you from ever having to confront it. Everything is going to be sanitized, clean, and safe. For you, so you don't have to worry about bad things happening to you. That sounds like steady progressivism. It's that's 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 what they try to do. They Thank try you to for your service, Matt. Yeah, yeah. They try to enact all of these preventative laws that prevent you from harming yourself or harming others. That's what they do, rather than address the crime when the, an actual crime takes place, where. An individual harms another individual. They want to enact laws that somehow will prevent you from committing the crime in the first place. And 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 again, oh, go the, here, here, here we go. Here's the next one. Are you ready? This okay. one really made blood shoot out of my eyes. I'll see how you handle this. Porn makes you less free. There is nothing freeing about porn. A, quote, free society, unquote, is not one that must or should feature easily accessed pornography. Porn kills freedom because it enslaves the viewer to his passions. What do you got well, to say about not, that, Lou? Huh? I think he's you, got you. Shut you down. He, he, he does. He does. I have to admit that nobody is free until they are restricted. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. Nobody, nobody is free until they are limited in what they are able to do. Nobody is free until they have somebody that tells them what is appropriate for them, what they may be permitted to do, and how the how they will be punished if they are disobedient. And by the way, those who tell them what they can and cannot do, and those who meet out the punishment for disobedience, are called servants. Because they serve you. What were you? Wasn't it you? I think it was you. Weren't you telling me before the show? Where did social conservatism have its root in America? I don't mean when I mean social conservative. I'm I'm actually a social conservative mm. for myself, well, not what, for what others. Okay, what is considered the modern social conservatism, uh, being opposed to homosexuality and, and all this so-called sexual degeneracy and everything else and being uptight, in the um, early 20th century, that was the plot of the leftist progressives. So – and particularly the, the ones in Europe and outside of the U.S. were, were very strong on that. Uh, as an example – 
down in Cuba, homosexuals were put into camps and executed for being homosexuals by the by the loving left progressives. Uh, also in the Soviet Union, different forms of uh, sexual degeneracy to include homosexuality was grounds for extermination. The Fabian socialists were quite famous for that, uh, along with their eugenics partners here in the U.S. As a matter of fact, uh, the Fabians learned about eugenics from people like Margaret Sanger and, and the ones that came before her here in the U.S., so the progressives. But ultimately, it goes back to the uh, – the the early Puritans, the ones that came over here and and first settled in the in in the what would become the colonies. So there you have it. This is just further proof that Matt Walsh is a yeah. progressive. And, and, and those early Puritans, those are those are the first ones to bring communism and religious extremism to America's shores. Yay! So and and Puritanism. This is, I mean, the title of this article. It's uh. You know, it's it's the neo uh, uh, the neo puritanicalism. It's it's left and right neo puritanicalism. It puritanism never fully left America, and it's still alive and well in both political wings of the American landscape. So my point, what I observed with this porn makes you less free diet little thing there is his, his argument is well, first of all. He's speaking freedom of slavery <laughs> or well in there. So uh, he's speaking in vague platitudes. Uh, I, 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 I call it a sound and fury signifying nothing. You know, I'm quoting Shakespeare. I didn't come up with that phrase. If I did, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing this show with Lou. I would probably be on Fox News right now with my beautiful eloquence. But alas, this is my lot in life. So, so Matt. I can't believe I just said I'd be on Fox News like that would be a good thing. Ugh, 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 I feel dirty. So, so, so for for Matt, what he what he's imagining is that that individuals are are helpless automatons that they have no free will. That porn is is some sort of beast that that grabs at people and puts a gun to their head and says you will watch this and you will become obsessed with this so he's not giving any agency to individuals that sounds like progressives to me man prostate progressivism right to me <laughs> well the modern, the modern conservatives are progressives well yeah that's the point of the article <laughs> that's that's exactly the point. I'm using his article to illustrate this point, and I picked him because, again, he's considered one of the thought leaders. I don't want to say that all conservatives think alike, just like all progressives don't think alike, but I'm just saying this is, this is absolutely a dominant undertone of much of conservatism in America, and it's remarkably similar to steady progressivism. Porn is not a sentient being threatening the viewer with violence. It's simply a sensory invitation that the viewer can reject or or not reject. And this type of thinking, it absolutely reduces human beings to helpless, unaccountable victims. It's not their fault, dude. It's porn's fault. And it's the job of the state to protect these helpless victims who have, have no free will, no agency to decide for themselves to reject this, this century invitation, which is all it is. And we'll get to our last point here. Are you ready for that? I'm ready. Laws matter. <laughs> <laughs> the law is a teacher. People are more likely to accept something as normal and moral if the law treats it as such. I, th I think he's now he's got you. I don't think you got to come back for that. Good luck. In order for laws to be respected, they must first be respectable. And kind of a kind of a slightly different subject, but. Uh, how how can how can the law how can the law be used by one as a legitimate act where 
for anybody else is considered a criminal act. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I, 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 I guess, it, I guess that's my big thing. Uh, this whole appeal to authority, appeal to, appeal to the, the word scribble down. I, and let, let me look at this again because I, I think I think he's engaging in uh, scribbling I, idolatry here. Um, yeah, oh, this law, is absolutely. Yeah, I, I say the law. He, the law is a teacher, so he sees the law as an entity of its own. Perhaps say like I don't know, maybe a god, uh, maybe a well, ri- yeah, maybe God a, maybe creates a rival, man. Maybe it's a maybe the law is a rival to Jesus Christ in his eyes. I don't know, but anyway, people yeah. are likely to accept something as normal and moral if the law treats it as such. Uh, no, not really. People are more likely to treat it, to accept something as nor- as normal and moral if it's been around for a long time. But that's that's simply the I'm used to it versus it's right. Uh, people accepted segregation and slavery as normal and moral for quite a long time too. Uh, in, well, in matter of fact, so those my were the law. My point would be that I believe, I'm not saying, well, if you create a law that is, that is, that doesn't line up with what people want to do, and let's call that morality, what people want to do, and what they want to do, they'll usually consider good, and what they don't want to do, they'll usually consider bad, and they'll form a morality out of that. Uh, If you look at it like that, like I do, if you create a law that fundamentally goes against what people want to do, the law is going to be feckless. But the law doesn't create the morality. Like, they had laws that legalized slavery because a huge chunk of people, that's what they wanted to do. They found an advantage of that. And so, you know, they, they had this sense of morality. They had this... American Constitution that talked about individual rights and and so they had to reconcile the fact that they had this this belief that was part of the American identity with the fact that at the end of the day they really enjoyed the, the advantage of uh, enslaving other people and preventing the people that they brought over from eventually competing with them so they developed a whole hierarchy of of weird science and and moralities to 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 create blacks as some sort of subcategory of human so it allowed them to keep hold of this individual liberty while at the same hand denying fundamentally the individual liberty of others and it wasn't law that created the morality they created the law to give their morality comfort justification or that to impose sense. their own, or to impose their their own version of morality on others, which is what the what, which, which is, is what, what the Puritans did, yeah, and that's what but, he wants that's, to do. That's what the Puritans did. They they were absolutely bedeviled that somebody somewhere might be happy, so they really harassed the living hell out of people, I and mean, they were very horrible to the Quakers. Yeah, they <laughs> they did not like the Quakers. <laughs> That's 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 for sure. Uh, but my 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 purpose of using this article is to show folks, especially even amongst the libertarian community, there are a number of people that the kind of well, I I I'm friends with kind of left leaning libertarians, right leaning libertarians. You know, I'm non hyphenated, so I'm I'm good swimming in all kinds of camps but but i i do know a fair number of right leaning libertarians that i would say and i understand they're looking at what the progressives are doing and they're starting to focus on the progressives and they're hating on the progressives when i say progressives i mean the statist progressives and and i understand why they're doing it but they're kind of losing track of the fact that the the right <laughs> that in some ways they're kind of gravitating back towards that statist right paradigm they're just left, as, left they're, paradigm well they're, right they're in going the sense back to, of they're going back to their leftist roots yeah but but a right in the sense of within the statist uh identity 
the statists identify left, identify right. They're all left by my standards, but, and I mean statist left. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm hoping to show here is these folks are just as horrible. And I guarantee you, see, right now you look and you see that conservatives, I'll use that term loosely, they control the House, they control the Senate. And they're starting to take back control of the judiciary. But they are nowhere close to controlling the marketplace. The progressives control the marketplace for the most part. They're nowhere close to controlling the media. The progressives almost exclusively control the media. And they're nowhere close to controlling the movies and the songs and the dances. They're nowhere close to, con to controlling the education systems. And the left, they have a lot of power in America. That's why they're exerting, the, they're exerting themselves to the degree that they are. I guarantee you, I can't guarantee you for sure, but I'm pretty close to guarantee you that if the conservatives had the same kind of power that the left has right now, that they would be imposing on you the same type of morality codes that the left want to exert. They would have their oh, version absolutely. of hate speech. Absolutely. If they, if they thought they could get away with it, oh, well, they have their version of hate speech. They don't want people to take a knee. They don't want people to not salute the flag. Uh, they, want, they don't want people to not engage in uh, idolatry. Uh, so it's so – Brian, Brian they, Barker I, says there's nothing moral about seatbelt tickets. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, and Larry said laws do matter, but it is legal. L l well, laws matter in, in, in terms of the reality of power they matter, but they're not morality. They're just, there's something written on a piece of paper. They're a wish written on a piece of paper by a legislator that, that intends to have people enforce the letter of that list, if need be, with the hope that they will get non-governed or gov governed people to behave in the way that they would like them to behave. That's all law is. And if you're in a situation where law, that piece of paper has actually sent somebody out with a gun to enforce it, then law matters. There's real power behind that law. And it's the individual that shows up to enforce it. That's where the real power is. Yep. Yep. I, I don't know if you have anything more to say about this. That's pretty much about it. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, I thought it was, a, <laughs> for my purposes, I thought it was an excellent article that exposes the statist progressive thought on, on the conservative right. And yes, they're all left by maybe our standards, but statist left, but... There you have it. If you guys have some opinions that are different than ours, be sure to share them with us. I I kind of like doing the show this way. What do you think? It's not too bad. Not I, too I still bad? Think, I, I still think it would be better if Larry had given the, the post a like. I, I, I think he's being a um, – I think he's holding back from us. I don't Larry think he's giving – Oh, no. Larry. Larry. No, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm looking at the likes yeah. for, the, for the page. Brian Barker for the, for the post. I see Aaron Thompson, Brian Barker, uh, Tyaga, uh, Tyagananda Swaraj. Yeah, uh, Don uh, Chavis, Chavis, uh, Becca Ray, and Jacob LaBelle. Those were the folks that were kind enough to give us a. Uh, they were kind enough to give the post a like, but Larry, he just he's being a free writer. He's not helping to. Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not seeing it on there, Larry. That's the whole problem. Yeah. I don't oh, see it there. Oh, Larry, when I said I thought it was an excellent article, I didn't mean the article I wrote. I meant the article that Matt Walsh wrote. It was an excellent article in exposing conservative thought. Not not my critique of the article, the actual article itself. So no, I was not. Not I was not congratulating myself on my own <laughs> article. But but thanks for noticing. I appreciate it. So. I think on that note, unless you have something else, I think we've we've punched this puppy in the head. We've made it happen. But I I, I think Larry still owes us a like for the post. You're not going to leave until Larry gives you a like. 
So, 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 Larry, I, I, I got, oh, he said I did like it. I don't know why. Well, Larry I'm not seeing banned are you, are, likes. Are you, are you, see, are you seeing it on, on the likes? Because I've reloaded the page several times. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, but, but I do see six likes. Yeah, and, and none I, of them are Larry. Come on, Larry, just give us one single like. Larry, that's I, all you have to do. I don't know. I don't feel. I feel. I feel dirty. I feel dirty. You're begging a do status. It, Larry, do it. You're, no, I'm not you're, begging. You're, you. Do it, Larry. Please do it. I'm not begging. Do it, Larry. Please. Do I'm, it. Not, I'm not begging. I'm not begging. I'm just asking nicely. I'm. I'm asking nicely. Oh, oh, hold on for a second. Ah. <laughs> uh, it decided to play itself in her ears. That was pretty awesome. So I I don't care if he likes the post or not. Actually, really, I don't. <laughs> I'm you know he 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 watches the shows. I appreciate it. All right. So uh, on that note, I I actually I kind of like this format. I like going through the stories first and then having a larger longer uh, discussion there at the end. I'm, yeah, I don't think that we're going to be super successful at staying on track and and doing it along the timeline. I think it's pretty much going to look like it does now and every other time. That's cool. I thought now it's pretty good. We actually hit all the stories mm -hmm. we wanted to hit, and we hit this. We we got everything we wanted to get in. Yes, we did it. We so I, it. I guess I guess my closing remarks would be: begging for a longer leash is not activism; it's just begging and. The, these people that are begging for a longer leash, they don't really want freedom. They just want permission. Yeah, I did owe that. I, I absolutely, uh, totally agree with that. And on that note, I'm going to say uh, bye to everyone. This is the last show of the week. There's no shows tomorrow. No headlines you may have missed. No is daily. We won't be back until... Monday, I'll be back on my personal Facebook page with headlines you may have missed. And we'll be back on this daily Monday with Professor Rambo. We're actually going to be doing an in-depth study of calibers from, I think it's a unique perspective that Professor Rambo came up with. So we're going to be talking calibers, and then we're going to be talking conspiracy theory. What is the deep state? dirty reason why the government is pushing for nine millimeter yeah that's the conversation we're gonna have on monday so Lou, america will america will not embrace the metric system i'm sorry <laughs> well i will i will never ever embrace i will i will i will die on my inches before i yield to the metric system i will <laughs> die on my inches so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, be sure that you book, if you bookmark the the show notes link there, wait, eh, maybe by tomorrow morning sometime, you'll get the audio version of the show. And also, probably by tomorrow morning, you can listen to the podcast version of the show on Twitter, on, uh, I'm sorry, Stitcher, as well as iTunes. Any, any last closing remarks? Uh, I, I think I uh, I think I did my closing remarks, but I want to thank Larry for finally giving me the like that Appreciate I've been Larry. asking for for all this time. I love you, Larry. Uh, thank you, thank you for your service, Larry. I love him. Have a good he's, he's have a good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. See you. See you next week.